Uh, we're not going to talk about mortality. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about uh, climate risks and capital requirements. Um, so I'm Darren Fleming. Uh, I'm a director at Deloitte uh, in Auckland in the actuarial insurance services team. And uh, as Billy said online, we've got Jerome Crignola. Uh, he's a director in, uh, with Deloitte in Zurich in Switzerland in the sustainability services team. Uh, we were co-authors on uh, the IAA's fifth paper in their climate series, um, along with uh, a few other actuaries. Um, so it's climate-related disclosures and risk management standards and leading practices. And a bit of a plug, on Wednesday afternoon, there's a, um, a session with some of the authors of all of the six climate papers um, to talk about the content of each of those papers. So please come along. Uh, this is our contents page, and um, we've got a bit to get through, so uh, I'm not going to focus on it too much, except to note uh, Jerome put in the picture on the right there of the French Joseph Glacier, so Ka Roimata o Hene Hokatere on the South Island of New Zealand. And uh, if you're um, sort of subscribing to everything that's been said earlier today, I'm getting quick to see it because it's disappearing, sadly. So it's uh, a bit of an introduction. Obviously, um, people are aware of this growing um, pressure on companies to respond to climate change, um, whether that's voluntary or mandatory disclosures, um, requests for stress tests from regulators, um, and scenario analysis. And capital requirements are beginning to be actively researched and debated um, by regulators. And so, Within the ESG context, so environmental, social and government, governance, so there's actually pressure right across the ESG um, spectrum to, uh, for companies to look at their external impacts and governance requirements. So, for example, the 17 uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and environmental uh, within that obviously includes climate change with the TCFD, which um, a lot of you would be familiar with, and then biodiversity and nature loss so the TNFD alongside that. Um, today we're just going to focus on climate change. Uh, we can cover the other topics some other time. So um, as part of uh, investigating the risk of climate change to organisations, so whether it's banking, insurance or pension funds, um, there's various risk topologies uh, which can be considered. And this is a way of categorising your risks and understanding them a bit more within your business. So those familiar with the climate space will obviously be familiar with physical risk and tra versus transition risk. So physical risk, actual impacts of weather events uh, versus transitional risks where you've got uh, regulation, um, changes in asset prices and that sort of thing. But we've also got other um, classifications which we could have. So again, spoken about earlier today in different sessions, asset risk. So the value of your assets on your balance sheet versus underwriting risk for insurers. So what business you're actually underwriting and, and how that impacts on your liabilities. Uh, and then we've listed a few more there. Acute risks versus chronic risks, um, existing book versus future sales and so forth. Um, so turning now to the actual capital requirements. So there's a bit of a sort of split into two about how uh, regulators might impose or allow for climate change in capital requirements. So we've got the so-called green supporting factors and we've got brown penalising factors. So green supporting factors seeking to reward um, behaviour which is positive in terms of climate action uh, and they'll potentially lower your capital requirements. And on the other side we've got brown penalising factors, um, so those impose higher capital requirements on entities who are uh, engaged in or, or uh, you know, underwriting risks from companies which have got adverse climate actions, for example, uh, fossil fuel companies. And, and these um, factors can be related to either investments on your asset side or underwriting, so whether you're, you're holding the investments in those companies or whether you're um, underwriting their risk. Uh, and some common definitions are, are really important when um, looking to impose this brown or, or green uh, approaches. Um, and there's a few uh, taxonomies which have been published. So the most widely known, I suppose, is the EU taxonomy on sustainable activities, um, which is released in 2020 and is undergoing a bit of a review at the moment, I understand. Um, but there's also uh, 
green taxonomies from uh, China and Russia and, and other places as well. Uh, as yet, uh, there's been no brown taxonomies officially adopted. Um, there are some that have been published by various organisations. And um, it, there's clearly a risk of politicisation uh, of definitions in any taxonomy that gets released. So where you've got uh, regulators, business owners, uh, politicians all trying to sort of get their view in, um, there's potential to move away from science based, a purely science based approach, no matter how long, how much you want to sort of keep it strictly science based approach. So that's sort of one of the, the areas to be aware of. Um, and any taxonomy has potential to impact the market. So pushing up, pushing up or uh, pushing down asset prices um, artificially, or, or perhaps deservedly so. And um, we would also note that um, capital treatment's probably a weaker incentive than um, perhaps tax reform or direct subsidies. Uh, there's clearly um, technical challenges in introducing uh, climate into capital requirements. So uh, first one there, emerging risks. Uh, climate's very much emerging. Uh, historic data potentially um, no longer holds, and so we need a real forward-looking uh, assess risk assessment. Uh, the systemic nature of climate change, uh, impacting right across the board, might limit the ability to hedge or diversify away from it. And there's potential loss of a link to actual risk-based considerations. So um, rewarding emissions reductions, uh, which have a long-term effect, um, might not impact your risk in the short term or lead to risk mitigation in the short term itself. And perhaps considering the sufficiency of your reserves, if you've got a whole lot of green discounts, um, might not stand up anymore to your actuarial calculations. Um, so we need to be conscious of that if we're going to reward uh, sort of green behaviours. Uh, Long-term horizon, so climate change, very long-term. Most uh, solvency capital regimes tend to be focused on sort of a one-year horizon, so there's quite a disconnect there in how, how do you incorporate um, or how do you reconcile those two approaches. And then the last one there mentioned is uh, evaluation approach. So Recently, we've been used to using uh, economic market value approaches to, to valuing things, but if we're going to have the concept of stranded assets or we're going to inflate or, or depreciate asset values different to the market value, um, then how do we reconcile those approaches with the, the sort of um, known economic approach? And, and noting that we're also, we're not just talking about risk, the variability around things, but also trends ongoing into the future. So how do we think about um, the capital requirements sometime in the future? And so thinking about this need for a forward-looking approach, um, we'll just put in a table to compare uh, different approaches. So I guess we're well used to using sort of the past-looking approach. We use statistics, um, extrapolating from that data into tomorrow to, to guess what it's going to look like. Um, so examples there, mortality tables, uh, actuaries favourite triangles, and so forth. Um, and the judgement there, I guess, is what models you put in place. Uh, moving on to the middle column, you've got thinking about the present, and that's the market-led uh, approach, market-consistent approach that I was talking about earlier. So using data from the markets to inform uh, what you're going to publish. But actually what we'll need for climate approach is a real forward-looking approach. So working out how the future will be different to uh, the current day and kind of exploring around that significantly. There's quite a lot of uncertainty in predicting what those future climate paths will be. Um, so using tools like climate risk scenarios to understand uh, what sort of capital requirements would need to be. Um, and, and looking at the current situation, um, we feel we've almost got this reverse journey. So in the past, we've done a lot of qualitative, oh, sorry, quantitative analysis, um, worked out our requirements. Around that, we've built uh, risk management and governance, and then we've moved into the reporting regime. Um, what we're seeing at the moment is we've got some reporting and disclosure requirements that companies are already having to implement. Um, and then as companies uh, bring those together, they're looking at their risk management governance practices and deciding that they need to update them so that they, they're much more uh, applicable and, and in order to cope with climate change. And then from there, perhaps sometime down the future, we're going to have to reconcile that with our quantitative approach. So 
um, we're sort of on this reverse journey than, than perhaps classically what, we, what we're used to. Um, so I'll hand over now to Jerome, uh, who's going to take us through some examples. Are you there, Jerome? Thank you, Darren, and good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right? Yep, you're good. Great, so you'll mend the slides, Darren. Thank you. See if you can get to the next one. So in the second part of our presentation, what I'll try and do is guide you through the, what's actually happening right now in regulatory circles around capital, climate-related capital requirements, from general conversations to, in a couple of cases, actual implementation. So at the international level, there's no framework yet. The International Association of Insurance Supervisors, the IAIS, has just started a new series of consultations on climate, but so far, capital requirements have not been announced to be in scope. So what we have mostly, if we look at various jurisdictions, is rhetoric, first thought pieces, and some stress tests. So several regulators, such as the Bank of England, our Japanese FSA, have expressed in uh, anecdotal interviews general support or interest in the ID, but so far without concrete plans to implement it. However, and I'll come back to that, an increasing number of countries have issued climate risk guidance and recommended or mandated to include climate in enterprise risk management frameworks. And maybe more concretely, uh, an increasing number of countries have been performing climate stress tests, right? Uh, so far without a clear link to, or an explicit link to capital requirements, but still that, that's the first step, I think. So that's been done here as well in Australia and New Zealand. I'll just mention a few more. The Netherlands were historically the first to deploy all rollouts such as climate stress test. The UK is so far the only uh, country that's been doing it twice. And the largest jurisdiction that's been doing it is the EU so far. They've done a really detailed one on banking, a very simplistic one on pensions, but nothing yet on insurance. Next slide. So as I said, an increasing number of countries have recommended or even mandated the inclusion of climate scenarios in ERM and OSA, for instance. That can happen in two ways. Either directly, you would have a piece of regulation or supervisory guidance that says you need to do that in OSA. That's what's been done in the EU or in New York State or Bermuda, for instance, but it can also be indirect. The growing number of countries that require their large companies to report under, for instance, DCFD, or that will require them to report under uh, the new uh, International Sustainability Standards Board of the IFRS, will indirectly ask them to do climate scenarios. Because, for instance, in DCFD, climate scenarios are part of the Pillar 2 uh, strategy. Obviously, modeling climate scenarios, uh, as you're probably aware, entails unique challenges. Those are very long-term projections to be meaningful, and also to be meaningful, they would need, which at the moment they often don't, to include physical tipping points and non-linearities, not just simple linear extrapolations of today's data set. Uh, and next slide, please. And because of these uh, many challenges, what I often hear when talking to fellow actuaries is that, oh, but we don't know how to do that. We are not climatologists, we're not geologists. But actually, climatologists would say, I can't do that because I'm no economist. And economists may say, I can't do that for insurance companies because I'm no actuary. So actually, what we need is a collaboration between all those professions. And as we've argued in a, in a piece that we've published with Deloitte, actually, most of what you need to, do, you need to use to properly start doing climate scenarios is already out there and open source. You already have all of the physical stuff that's been modeled and published by the IPCC. And then you have this, let's say, middle layer of economic or macroeconomic projections derived from the physical scenarios that's been performed by the NGFS. So the, the NGFS is the network for greening the financial system. And that's actually all, or more, not all, but most of the central banks and financial supervisors coming together. So they've done a lot of great work. It's also free and open source. So what we actually is we need to do is actually only the last mile of plumbing, so to speak, meaning we already have the physical stuff, we have the economic stuff, we need to translate it into the financial variables that would be relevant for a bank, an insurance company, or a pension firm. So it's 
certainly a delicate and difficult modeling task, but not as daunting as we would assume to do. Next one. So now maybe to actual examples, very few countries around the world, the world have already uh, implemented climate-related capital requirements, but two did. So two small European countries, we've got Hungary, and we've got the Channel Island of Guernsey. So for those of you who may not know Guernsey, it's a very, very small self-governing island that's lying in the channel between France and the UK. So from this meager data set of two points, I'll still try and uh, have a couple of conclusions, which is those are two European countries. Uh, in both cases, as I'll explain, they've implemented green supporting factors, which is easier politically than broad penalizing. And uh, third, uh, they have started to look at assets before looking at underwriting and insurance risk. So let's start with Hungary. They've introduced in 2020 a green, fact, a green capital factor, so capital relief for sustainable lending, allowing for a capital discount on basically green mortgages, so lending on housing with a good uh, energy efficiency rating, also on green bonds, and that's been later expanded to include solar power generation, sustainable agriculture, or uh, immobility, or lending to those activities. Uh, Guernsey have introduced a green supporting factor, so again, capital relief for potential capital relief for life insurers fixed income investments from 21. That's done through a discount on the spread on the capital required to uh, uh, back spread risk. Uh, and also the procedure is interesting. So the eligible assets need to comply with the Guernsey Green Fund rules with amendments to the investment policy, risk management, uh, prior supervisory approval, and also disclosure to policyholders. Again, you may think, okay, those are two, that's one medium sized and one very small country doing it. Uh, what does that mean globally? Actually, I think, as I've tried to explain before, that the idea of twisting, uh, tweaking the capital requirements to allow for climate risk is in the air. It's being discussed in an increasing number of countries. And he, I do believe in the power of narrative. So if two countries, even small ones, have been doing it and it functions well, it's likely to catch fire and spread. We use a poor climate-related metaphor. <laughs> next slide, please. So actually, what's one of the next jurisdictions that will likely do it is a much bigger one. That's the European Union uh, in its uh, Solvency II capital regime. So it's already been decided in the EU that the natural catastrophe module in Solvency II standard formula will be recalibrated to allow for increasing physical risks in light of climate change. We don't know exactly when or with which new parameters, but the general direction of travel has been decided. And also recently, uh, IOPA, so where I used to work actually, which is the uh, European Union insurance supervisor, uh, consulted on further future amendments uh, on potentially uh, climate trans uh, changing climate transition risks for assets or changing capital requirements for transition risk. So that could be a green or brown factor, uh, a potential green factor for uh, company insurance companies that have good climate adaptation strategies in their underwriting business. And they've even mentioned, even though it's much further on the horizon, uh, potentially looking at social topics, so the S and the ESG. So this is coming, we don't know exactly when or in which form, and, but this is coming, at least in the European Union, we will have climate-related capital requirements, or changes to capital requirements linked to climate. Yeah. Next one. So in conclusion, again, what does this mean for us actuaries and how can we contribute? So as has eloquently been said in the previous presentation, the tra what's the traditional role of actuaries has evolved over time. We started with, historically, centuries ago, with pricing and reserving. In the last decades, again, as has been mentioned, we moved to economic valuation, capital modeling, big data, etc. So climate and sustainability are, in our opinion, natural next step. And we think that actuaries should be actively involved in the current debate around whether, how, and when to uh, adapt capital requirements for climate-related risks. However, and again, uh, supporting what's been said in the previous, by the previous speakers, 
To do so, we need to think a bit out of our traditional actuarial box and develop new ways of working with other experts, whether climate scientists, economists, etc., for instance, to derive meaningful climate-related scenarios. And with that, I'll conclude and thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to take a few questions. Thank you, Darren, and thank you, Jerome. Um, so we've got some questions. I, I've got one question here. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for the very informative. I, you know, I, I was a little bit surprised that you know Hungary's done a lot on, on that front. So that's really good. Um, so, uh, so this question. Before I ask these questions, uh, I will add. I will add uh, a question before this question. So, uh, perhaps uh, you know, uh, Darren or Jerome, you can comment on the sufficiency of the reserves, if the green discounts, uh, if it discounts for the green factors, and the questions uh, from the audience is, actually, who will pay for this capital deficiency uh, due to this, you know, over generous green factors? And is that really a good way to encourage green behavior? Yeah, so I, again, I think as we acknowledged in the presentation, that's sort of moving away from the strict actuarial uh, approach that um, we've been used to. Um, I think that the examples, or cer certainly in Guernsey, there is a limit on the amount of um, green discount that you can claim, and so that is holding up the level of your reserves to a certain amount. Um, but I, I think it's something that would need to be watched and made sure that um, it wasn't being overused or you know sort of abused, and if, if it was um, producing sort of uh, extra risk then it would need to be reconsidered. I mean, perhaps one side of it is if the green discounting is successful and promotes appropriate behaviour and limits um, climate change um, to a certain extent, then maybe that path is perhaps a bit more justified than, than what the actuarial numbers might say. I don't think there's an easy answer to it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, we've if I may add on, on quickly on, maybe quickly on this, on the... Uh, whether green uh, discounts uh, in capital would, uh, would be risky. I, I would just remind uh, us all that regulatory processes are never just science-based. They're also part of a political debate. And politically, it's so much easier to, have, to agree on capital relief than to uh, so green factors rather than on capital add-ons, broad factors. So that's the less risk-based and science-based part of the equation that we have to keep in mind. But I agree that potentially if we only introduce green factors, then there's a, there's a risk that this would lead to uh, insufficient capital or reserves. I think other than the climatologists and the economists, maybe we have to get the uh, po politicians involved as well. <laughs> uh, I think we've got a question at the back. Yeah, please. Hi, hello, um, uh, Simone Brathwaite. Now, in terms of the um, potential to be used for capital requirements, I thought one of the concerns were that the evolution of the climate scenarios, like the NGFS phase two to phase three, a lot of the answers had uh, results varied widely. So it's, the application is still quite subjective. So I do appreciate the use of these scenarios for uh, developing new products and uh, internal risk management, but I'm not sure what's the path to get them into a a capital requirement, a regulatory capital requirement, given the uncertainty in the various outcomes between, um, depending on which IAM model you use within the NGFS. So I was wondering if you had any feedback on where you, how you think this is going to play out. Yeah, no, I recognise that as well. I mean, it's all very well um, presenting different scenarios in, in, in the future, but actually, yes, coming up with numbers based on them in sort of for today's capital requirements is certainly going to be a challenge and it'll be interesting to see how that unfolds. Um, I don't know if you had anything specific on that, Jerome. Uh, no, just adding to that, something we've not mentioned, maybe specifically for, for non-life insurance with one-year property contracts or motor contracts. So meaningful, a meaningful way to look at climate risk would be those very long-term scenarios, but then we would, need, we would need to come up with assumptions around future sales or renewals of non-life business, which would be indeed very tricky. And I think it's one of the key technical difficulties that's not been addressed yet. Yeah. 
Great. Uh, I've got another very good question here. So uh, I'll read the question first because I want to add to the end of the question <laughs> as well. Uh, the question is, uh, I note the Bank of England recently confirmed they will not be changing the 12 month view of recapitalization following a climate event. Are other regulators taking a different view? So my other question would be, how do you actually um, reconcile a climate risk being a long-term risk with the capital requirements being a probably a 12-month horizon as well? Sorry, I a lot of questions throwing at you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I'll pass that one straight to Jerome. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Maybe no thank you, Darren. That's, that's a tough but good question, <laughs> indeed. I, most, there may be a few we're not aware of, but most solvency regimes and capital requirements frameworks are one year. They, are, they aim at ensuring with a high probability the financial survival of the company over the next year. And that's, uh, well, you probably heard the term from, uh, from Bank of England Governor Mark Carney, uh, the tragedy of the horizon, right? Since climate risk is not necessarily a huge risk coming, a huge amount of risk coming in just next year, but building up over time, that there's a discrepancy between this series of one-year views. And so if, if we myop, myopic, myopically look in succession at just one-year horizons, in the end, we will have missed what's happening on what will happen on 20 or 30 years. So that's a key I would say conceptual uh, flow or difficulty here. Current frameworks are one year, and climate risk is 20, 30, 50 years uh, uh, in the future if we want to consider all meaningful effects and ju not just a little increase in natural catastrophes, which have its, has its place here. As, uh, as we mentioned, it's been planned with EU, for instance, but it's just one tiny part of the overall climate story with potentially stranded assets. Uh, non-linear tipping points that mean huge economic shifts or physical changes. And this, at the moment, it's not possible to capture it in a one-year view. So I'm waiting for a question. Uh, uh, yeah, please. I think in, in China, they've been able to introduce a green capital charge because the, the regulator's remit is political or is partly political. I wonder if you see any appetite in Britain with reform of solvency too, to be more political, if there's any appetite for green capital charges there, even if there is in Brussels as well. Thank you. Oh, so I, can't, I can't comment on the UK, I'm afraid. Um, but yes, it's obviously very political decisions, but um, if, you know, the will of the, the government is to introduce them, then they were able to do that. Right? And if that's how they want to drive um, action on climate change and they feel that's the best way, then I guess that's, that's their prerogative, right? Um, yeah, I don't know if you've got any comments about um, Europe there, yeah, Jerome. Yeah, yes, in the EU, it is very much a political debate. So in the European Parli Parliament, we have seen amendments back and forth, so supporting or cancelling such proposals around uh, climate-related capital factors uh, along the traditional political lines, actually. Uh, so this is very much also a political process. And I think that's, uh, as we mentioned before, that's the real difficulty here with how do we reconcile science-based considerations on climate risk and the, the, the undeniable fact that regulation is part of the political process. And at the moment, the debate is still ongoing. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if there are any more questions. Um, if not, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Darren and Jerome once again.